Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining Price Lapses uh, Product Updates webinar. I have two colleagues here with me today, Becca and Rishi. Uh, we're going to wait for a few more, uh, like a minute or two, to let more people pour in, and then we'll start the webinar. As always, this is getting recorded, and we will upload this on our YouTube channel after the, after the uh, webinar is done. Uh, we will also send you an email uh, about the with the recording. Uh, we're also going to take live questions, whether you have about the updates or anything uh, adjacent to it. We're going to take those questions as well and um, keep them coming. At the bottom of your screen, you'll see a Q&A box. If you click in that, like it says literally Q&A, and if you type there, you can see uh, questions that uh, that have been answered, etc., that have been asked and that have been answered. So uh, if you have the same question, you can upload someone's question, or if you have a different question, feel free to ask. Um, and then at the end of this webinar, we're going to do something new as well. Like I said, uh, I have another colleague with me here, Rishi. Rishi uh, leads our design team, and he has uh, he's going to give you a view into what's upcoming, and he wants ideas from you on one, how do you like the design of that? And if you have any other comments. So that's that's the agenda for today. We're uh, one, going to cover the latest updates. Number two, we're going to uh, show you uh, some of the upcoming designs. If you have questions, uh, feel free to ask. There's a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. You can see others' questions and you can also uh, ask yours and you can upload others' questions as well. Um, try to keep questions more General one-on-one uh, -on -one questions require us to go into the account and see a little bit of what's happening in the account. Uh, so if you have a very account-specific question, ask that to our support team. But if you have overall uh, like uh, strategy or how price apps works kind of a question, uh, you can ask that in the Q&A box. With that, I'm going to start sharing my screen. And you should be able to see my screen. Becca, can you confirm that? Mm -hmm. Yep, that's perfect. Okay. And Becca will also be helping me with uh, Q and A's and uh, Rishi will be, like I said, helping with the product design. Cool. Um, one second, let me see if my other screen's ready. Okay, all righty. I'm good to roll. Cool. Um, so as you know, we've been uh, we've been launching out several features over the last couple of weeks here. Every month we run this webinar. Uh, usually happens in the first week or second week of a month. You get uh, emails from us about product updates, and you also get a notification within the product about registering for this webinar. So thank you for registering for this webinar. This week we're going to cover. Uh, three key updates that we have launched that help you uh, manage your account better. And uh, like I said, Rishi is going to share what's upcoming in terms of designs. Cool. The number one thing that we uh, have done, and uh, Becca and I were with our team just before this call, and we were talking about this in a slightly different way, but uh, a lot of you at some point or the other use are date specific overrides. Date specific overrides are is a feature that allows you to uh, override the price lapses recommendation. Uh, it can be it's generally used for maybe you don't like price for a certain day and you want to increase prices. You don't like price for a certain date. You want to decrease prices. You maybe for certain events want to set up a minimum price or set up certain minimum stay restrictions, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, right. Sometimes for a certain uh, time period, you want to just quickly discount certain number of days. Um, and for that kind of a setting, what we have rolled out is we've always had date specific overrides, but now we are one allow you to choose certain days. And number two, we allow you to also duplicate that setting on uh, other set of days. So what that means is if you guys can screen my uh, price lab screen and Becca, can you confirm that if my price lab screen is visible? Okay, cool. Thank you. Uh, so if you can see my price tab screen for say for example, uh, and I've I'd done this uh, yesterday. Let's say uh, March is a good season for me, and um, or actually no, never mind. Let I'm in Florida for this property, and I'm looking at um, this uh, 
this period, which is my July uh, 4th period, right, uh, Independence Day. And here, what I want to do is I want to create an override because uh, even though this is a Tuesday, maybe I want to include that as well and create a really longish weekend. And on that, I want to set up a minimum price of uh, maybe a fixed minimum price for my property, even though my regular minimum price is 150. On this day, I know my Florida beach house can fetch 1100 uh, over a thousand dollars, right? I want to create that override. Normally, I would do this and you'd see that override created. And next week, next year, you'd have to still remember, et cetera, et cetera. What you can do uh, right now is you can go to advanced override settings. You can copy this to another date range very quickly. So you can go in and say, hey, not just for this year, I want to remember this for 2024 as well. And uh, I see it's here. So I want to do it uh, for this period. And uh, in 2025 also, I want to quickly go in and create it so that I remember it, right? Um, and I don't forget it the next time. Or maybe, uh, so that's that's one, one thing, right? Maybe for my December period, I wanted to, on this uh, holiday, holiday week, I want to have a seven day uh, customization. I can do that very quickly. The other thing that you might sometimes do is, for example, you might feel like uh, in the more recent periods uh, or at any point of time, just in this November month, um, I want to have my Friday prices a little bit higher than what Price Labs is recommending. Um, now, if you wanted to have your Friday prices across the board higher than, uh, than what Price Labs is recommending, you'd normally hop on here in edit click day of week pricing and say, hey, on Friday, I want my prices to be 20% higher than what Price Labs is recommending. But in this case, uh, if you just wanted it for a certain period, say just for November month, you would have to click here, uh, do Price Labs recommended 20% higher, save this, and then keep on doing that for the next five days. What you can now do is quickly say, I select this period. Uh, I'm not sure what I'm doing wrong. Uh, Anyway, uh, I maybe I just select this and I go to all the way to November and then I say, hey, uh, percent, I want this to be 20% higher, but I only want this, this setting that I was trying to apply only for a certain day. I just wanted to apply for Friday and I can just want to apply for Friday and then I can add it. If I add it now, you'll see this override does not get added for all days, but if I look at it in November, only on Fridays is this override added. And so that adds a certain level of speed. Uh, I do want to mention two other things. If you're using groups, if you hop into customizations, and if you're using groups, you can create overrides at group level. That also leads to efficiency. So if you create an override at a group level, you can uh, see like that will apply to all of your listings underneath and you can still use the same advanced settings. If you're not using groups and if you're just, if you have all of your properties in one area, you can do the same thing by clicking the account calendar and in the account calendar, maybe every, like for December, for this holiday week, um, I want to have uh, seven night minimum stays and that will override all of your uh, settings. So just for that, if, if there are certain days, et cetera, et cetera, that you want to override, uh, this adds efficiency. Uh, group setting things at group level, account level, these overrides, and then uh, you creating either for certain days or copying it to another date range. Hopefully you don't have to use overrides a whole lot. If you're, we were talking about this earlier today, if you're using overrides a lot, and very frequently chat with us because uh, there might be other ways to automate what you're doing, but there are occasional days that you need to override and uh, this hopefully adds efficiency to that. Cool. Any questions on that, Becca, or any questions uh, for uh, from anyone on this? Nope, it's been pretty quiet so far. <laughs> All righty. Um, maybe it was straightforward. Um, Again, this call is getting recorded. Uh, you'll get a recording and then there's a QA and a box at the bottom of the screen. Click that to ask any questions or anything else that you have. Alrighty, uh, moving to the next question here. The uh, next, not question, next uh, update here. We have launched, uh, we've, we'd launched base price tool uh, earlier this year, 
right? We're spending a lot of time trying to improve how it works, uh, especially in the volatile situation that we are. All of you, if, you have, if you're actively using Price Labs, I'm hoping that you've set up a base price. Base price is uh, the average price that you charge throughout the year. What it really does is gives us the understanding of relative positioning of your property in the market. How do you access this base price help tool? Is if you're in Price Labs and if you're on the review prices page, um, and let me hop in here. If you're on the review prices page, and if you click help me choose a base price, this is where you find the uh, the base price help. And even though I have set up a base price of 430, what Price Labs is right now saying is, hey, maybe you should move your base price to 488. Mine's a trial account. I've had crazy fluctuations on my base price. But what Price Labs is saying is, hey, uh, like just before uh, this call, my base price really was around 500 plus. So what Price Labs was at that time saying was, hey, we recommend you to drop it to 488 because your prices were, uh, you, you had a lower historical occupancy compared to the market, right? You can also see when this was last generated. So this is this in itself is not new, the recommendation. What is new is we have changed how we calculate this. So far, we were looking at, only historical information. So last 30 to 60 days to seeing how your base price was doing versus uh, how your property uh, was getting occupied versus the rest of the market, right? And if it was getting uh, far less occupied, we would recommend dropping prices. If it was getting a lot more occupied, we'd recommend increasing prices in, in the most simplest sense, right? There's a uh, logarithmic data science, blah, 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 that gets applied that I don't fully understand. Uh, but in the most simplest sense, if your occupancy was lower than the market uh, historically, we'd recommend reducing prices in, uh, if it was higher, we'd recommend increasing prices, right? And we would look at, uh, closest similar properties to you. What we have changed is we're not just looking at uh, historical, we're looking at both historical and forward looking uh, occupancies. So historical are fully realized because I know say on October 10th uh, or like say in the month of September, you were booked at 70% and market was booked at 50%. You were booking a lot more and we might increase ask you to increase your base price uh, but now what we're doing is we're not just looking at historicals we're looking at both historicals and future it might be that historically you were booking really well but in future you're not booking as well and so that would that would make it different uh, that would that would make us uh, understand that kind of a logic a little bit different if you're booking more and if you're booking more historically and booking less in future we may not ask about as much increase. The other thing that's changed is um, when you first start with price labs or when you first start syncing a property, we started showing this recommendation within the first seven days. We realized we need a little bit more time to figure out what your base price should be. So now when you first sync a property, it takes uh, 14 days for us to come up with a base price. The other thing that happens is for the first 60 days of your syncing, first 60 days or so, and we, we, we play with that to figure out what's our uh, what's the what's the optimal uh, time frame that we need. But uh, consider 60 days. For the first 60 days, we don't uh, show you aggressive changes on your base price. We assume that you understand how to set your base price based on market levels, right? And we do small tweaks to it. But once we cross 60 days of syncing with us, we better understand how your property compares to your market. And we are able to do a better recommendation, uh, if that makes sense. If you're not sure how to think about your market-based levels, uh, next to this recommended, you also see market-based. Not a new feature, but I just want to cover it uh, while we're here. You can click this market-based uh, and say you have a three-bedroom property. Um, normally, when you're uh, hop in, you'd see all of these bedrooms checked because we're not sure uh, what's the size of your property. How, how do you think it compares, right? Uh, so you may want to select maybe mine's a smallish three bedroom. And so it really it compares with two bedrooms and three bedrooms both, or maybe mine's my three bedrooms just a three bedroom, or maybe my three bedrooms really a very large, uh, like a largest three bedroom, which really compares with four bedrooms, right? And then the second thing is, what is the quality of your property? Whether it's uh, low, like by low, I mean like a budget-friendly property, medium, uh, average kind of property, high, it's at the 75th percentile of the market, it's an upscale property. 
And so if you choose that, that can help you understand what is the market base level. And the other thing that you can do is on this map, uh, you'd see all of these properties that we are looking at. Uh, maybe you know your market better and you say, hey, all of these beachfront properties are usually a lot higher compared to where I am. I actually want to click this lasso tool. I want to just select uh, this. Nah, let me reset this. Um, I want to select this area where I want to compare prices because I don't really want to take these ocean prices. And if I do save, uh, you'll see this change from 478 to 448. So that's that's how you decide the market-based level when you're starting out with a new property, et cetera. And then over time, Price Labs will recommend a change uh, for your property. Uh, first time, it takes about 14 days. And then uh, in, after that, every six to seven days, it recommends. Over time, we are also going to add nudges so that we can tell you when there's a major change. So you'll see a pop-up notification within Price Labs to saying, hey, uh, it's time to relook at your base price. There's there's quite a bit to be done on uh, base price. And so our data science team, we, we have a couple of data science team members who are specifically focusing on base price of how can we continuously make it better. So if there are things that you're seeing that you're not sure of, feel free to reach out to us at support at pricelabs.co and uh, we'd be happy to look at your specific scenarios as well. Any questions on that? Um, it's so been we really couple, quiet. Okay. Yeah. We have a couple questions. Um, James is asking, can I have it only compare to lakefront properties? So if he's, you know, either lakefront, oceanfront, I think we do get this question quite a bit. Fair enough. Yeah. Um, today we don't, so for market-based pricing, right? Um, Today, we don't allow those filters. We are adding those filters for you to be able to do that. But there are there are a couple of things uh, which, uh, James, by the way, you've walked into my next product update here, right? But if you were specifically talk, talking about uh, figuring out your base price, the, the right way to do a, go about it would be uh, zooming in on this and then selecting an area which is uh, like your uh, beachfront area, right? And that can help you figure out what that market base level would look like. That's for the base price. Um, next, uh, we'll talk about the next feature. So I I leave the, the feature about if I want to compare, uh, there, are, there are three places where we use data and today they're disparate data sets. Over time, we will, uh, uh, we will uh, combine them. The challenge with combining when you have 150,000 properties or more sinking at the same time. We want, we're a little slow because we can only make so fast changes on our pricing front because we don't want to break what's working, right? So uh, there is uh, uh, there is uh, one place where we use data, which is to figure out base price. This does not impact what is used for your dynamic pricing, right? The next place where we use uh, data is what is used for dynamic pricing. And we keep perfecting and improving what is the comp set that we use? And we're going to keep improving that. And the next place where we use data is, uh, is in neighborhood data, where you can see how do your prices compare to the market, right? Now, um, traditionally, our, the data that we use for dynamic pricing and for neighborhood data was similar, but we heard from customers that they wanted to use their own specific set, comp sets to benchmark, right? And so what we have done now is uh, here, if you if you click, let me go back. If you click this pink thing, you'd see which source to select. You can select nearby listings, which is Price Labs. We are automatically curating 300, 350, 400 uh, listings uh, closest to your property. And uh, we're showing those and we're uh, showing those on the SCOM sets. But you can also select a market dashboard as a source. Within market dashboard, now you can create any kind of comp set. Um, the comp sets that we were talking about, which is like uh, lakefront or certain amenities, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm going to uh, quickly hop into market dashboards here and talk about, and this will take a few seconds uh, to load. And I'll talk about how to create a comp set and then how will you see it here. But in the meantime, uh, Becca, any questions uh, that you have that we can answer while uh, I help load this? Um, so that's kind of, we can circle back to that one. Um, 
One that's kind of interesting is, has there been any development on being able to differentiate blocked dates versus booked dates? And I think that there has been. So uh, block dates versus book dates, uh, absolutely right. Depending on the PMS that you use, if they send us the difference between block dates and book dates, we uh, we differentiate it and we, uh, we can, uh, particularly for portfolio analytics, you see it, you don't see the block dates, you see book dates. On dynamic pricing, we've heard uh, mixed views of some people wanting to use block dates still as occupancy because that means they have like the maybe the mortgage does not change or if they're running an arbitrage model how much they need to pay the customer does not or their not customer the owner does not change um and so they still want to use those block dates as official uh, occupancy uh some don't uh, so we don't have a clear answer there we are able to differentiate uh if you have questions about your specific account reach out to us at support at pricelabs.co um and we can help and I don't know, Becca, if you have any other, other insights on that. I know you work with customers who have this uh, block versus book issue sometimes. No, um, I think it's important to remember for the ones, for the PMSs that we are actually differentiating that, it means that in our like pricing algorithms, we are saying, okay, you, you're you booked on this date, you're blocked on this date. So it's not going to affect things like your pricing. But I believe that in the health indicators, it's still just going to show you your occupancy regardless of being booked or blocked. So that's something that just came up. Yeah, so on this, uh, uh, what Becca means is, so for example here, in this indicator, uh, and we'll, we'll confirm this after the call uh, because I, I'm not fully sure of the answer, uh, but I, as far as I know, it includes uh, booked block days as well. Um, and we're not, like today, we don't know what the right answer is, if we should include block yeah. days or not, right? If you okay. have opinions about that, feel like, uh, let us know. Um, which way it is and maybe the answer is we may end up creating two parallel features where if someone wants to use book or not not use it right maybe that's the longer term answer for it um cool let us uh, hop into the market dashboards and again how how we ended up on market dashboards is because uh, there are three data sources that are uh, primarily used on price labs one for base price to help you determine the base price Number two, it's on the uh, on the calendar for dynamic pricing. We auto create comp sets and we keep fluctuating those comp comp sets. Um, we're figuring out how to give users the control because uh, we don't the comp sets while customized should not be too far customized uh, that they exactly look like your properties. But what we allow there is for you to benchmark against your specific competition, right? Which is the neighborhood data. Within neighborhood data so far, we used to allow you only to look at nearby listings. Now we also allow you via market dashboards to look at certain things. Uh, market dashboards are basically, you can create a market dashboard where you can see uh, you can see certain area and all of the properties in that area and various kinds of information uh, for uh, the properties in that area. What you can also do here is, so uh, for example, I have created, this is in France uh, area, it's a rural uh, location. I have, I am tracking about 50 kilometers in this and I have about uh, 2000 uh, odd active listings in this area that I'm tracking. Right, and I can see a bunch of metrics, but uh, to remain uh, focused on what we're doing here, what I can do is I'm tra tracking all of these uh, 2000 properties, but maybe I just want to look at all two bedrooms in this area um, that have, let's say, I don't know if anyone in this area has a hot tub and a pool and allow pets. So I'm going to just select that. And so let this uh, thing load. Now you'll see all of these columns also. So I'm looking at all two bedrooms that have pets allowed. And I don't know if anyone has pool. Let's just look at how big that pool of pool is. So I'm going to say, uh, also look at yes there. And so I have, uh, I should have clicked create concept first, equal to two um, and then pets hot tub, pool. Um, I'm going to create a comp set with equal to two bedrooms with uh, pets allowed as yes, with uh, pool as yes, right? And so I have uh, about four pages of properties. I do select all 
and I call this uh, LeBlanc two bed uh, pool plus uh, pets allowed, right? And those are the properties that I want to compare myself against, right? And I'll just do this generate comp set. So price labs, oh, um, not plus, not allowed to use plus. Um, so I'll create this comp set and price labs will save this comp set and uh, and now start tracking various kind of information about this comp set. Uh, it'll track, uh, for example, what is the average revenue? It will track uh, what is the future occupancy looking like? You can also, for this comp set, see past occupancies. You can see pricing information. You can see a bunch of other stuff. And where you'd find it is you'd find it down here in this. Uh, you see how I had for Airbnb, LeBlanc to two bed, two pool. So if I click this and click apply, uh, this dashboard will update with that information. But now that I have done this, if I come back in here and if I go into neighborhood data again, um, for my market dashboard with LeBlanc, I should, um, let me see this. No, let me refresh this page one second. Pop into neighborhood data here. Click this, go to market dashboards for LeBlanc market dashboard. Um, I should see my uh, comp set that I have created, created which is if you see Airbank, uh, Airbnb comp, LeBlanc two bed pools pets allowed. And so if I now check that, well, and I can see it here, this is the comp set that I'm comparing against. Mine's a three bedroom. And you'd see for this comp set, uh, how does my price compare? How does the occupancy of this comp set looks like? And so it allows you to do benchmarking. So those are the those are the three key updates that I wanted to walk you guys through. Um, this one's a little bit confusing, so let me know if you have any questions. Um, and yeah, uh, Becca, any questions on all of this or anything specific you want me to dive into? Um. We had one question that said, how far above market occupancy is too much? And I think that was potentially referring to when we were talking about the health, health indicators. Metrics. Um, yeah. Greg, if you want to, or sorry, uh, James, if you want to sort of clarify, if you want to send a follow-up, um, that would be great. Um, again, we are, uh, this is re being recorded. I'm not sure, are we going to share the slideshow as well, or are we just going to share the recording? We're just going to share the recording, the slideshows. Uh, there's really not a whole lot on the slideshow. Um, yeah. Cool. Um, but yeah, I guess, uh, Greg, if you, or James, if you want to clarify, um, let us know. Occupancy is usually really high in the blue. Yeah, so we're talking about the, the health indicators. Yeah, um, this is a diff difficult one. This is a more, uh, a little bit of, individual choice somewhat and a little bit of playing around, right? Um, I personally don't like seeing blues. I personally, uh, and again, these are called performance indicators. If you hop into this question thing, if you search for uh, performance indicators here, uh, performance metrics, uh, you'll see red is when you're below market occupancy, yellow is when you're uh, like, close to market occupancy. Green is when you're just above market occupancy and blue is when you're quite high above, like up to 20% uh, above market occupancy, right? Uh, blue to me generally means like you have a, a fair share of the market and you might have an opportunity to increase your price. Normally, if you're consistently in blue across all of these things, uh, we may, price labs may tell you to adjust your prices higher, right? Um, but having said that, uh, this is a little bit of an individual call of uh, saying, do you want to operate in blue or in green? You definitely don't. What I can tell you is you don't want to operate in yellows and reds. You, uh, whether you want to operate in blues and greens is a little bit of uh, a little bit of an individual call. Because I'm not sure how you tackle that. Yeah. So my background is being in a seasonal market. I'm here in, in Charleston, South Carolina. So my goals for my property sort of changed throughout the year. So like in my really low season, um, 
you know, if I was trying to get like a monthly rental uh, that, you know, maybe it was for a lower ADR, but at least covering more, you know, occupancy, then my goal would be blue, obviously. Same thing in my high season, you know, here in Charleston, here in our barrier islands, you're going to be at, you know, 80, 90% occupancy. So for my high season, you know, I'd like to see definitely blues and greens, but maybe in my shoulder seasons, I might be okay with some yellows creeping in there, especially if I have maybe a a higher end product, um, because that might say, Hey, I'm actually okay with leaving a couple of days open. I'm going to try to get that higher ADR. So, and it depends on your inventory. It depends on your market. It depends on your own goals. Yeah. Uh, no straight answer. You definitely don't want to be in reds, but having yeah, said that no, no also, <laughs> also like if I am looking at, uh, you also a little bit want to understand what is your ideal, uh, booking window because I right now have 3730 because in uh, in where my properties are in those markets um, in those markets it's very last minute bookings right but if you're in markets which have uh, long term bookings you can not long term long booking window bookings uh, you can click these three dots and you can change this to saying I want to track seven day availability 15 day availability and maybe 60 day availability right um, so it depends a little bit on what kind of uh, booking windows do you want to track. And so my seven day right now looks poor, but you saw my three days looked good because in my market, I really get a lot of last minute bookings. And so I really don't care all that much about what's happening at seven day. I really care about what's happening at a uh, three day mark for my market. Right. So, uh, so I might go back here and say, um, look at this and I look at, how well am I doing on the seven day metric, right? Uh, oh, sorry, did I not change that? I thought I did. Um, how well am I doing on uh, my uh, three day metric uh, is what I really want to track compared to seven days. It's fine. I'm not, uh, I'm, I'm okay with that uh, on seven days, right? But it depends a little bit on your account. Cool. Uh, Becca, any somewhat, other questions? Yeah, two yeah. somewhat related questions. We have one that's how often do you recommend that we recheck base pricing? And then we have somebody that loves our nudge idea and is hoping for somewhat an ETA on this feature because I feel like those are kind of related. Yeah, um, the base price, uh, there are two times, like one, um, we recommend base prices today every seven days, right? Uh, once you're once you're using price labs, the first time uh, after the fourteenth day, and then after that every seven days. Uh, but having said that, uh, you don't need to really check every seven days. You may want to check it uh, once every month if you're if you're using price labs consistently and have been using price labs. Uh, the only time where you may want to come in uh, in between months is if you know that your market is changing, there's a seasonal change. In that times, you may want to check it once every week or every every other week, right? But if it's a stable market, you're okay with checking it once a month, right? So, so no clear answer there, but uh, once every month generally, unless uh, like right now in a lot of US markets, we'd be, we uh, in September, we went from a high season into a low season. And so at that time, it, it would be worth checking, right? And for say, if you're in ski markets, in November, we'd be going into high season. And so at that point, it might be worth checking uh, once every week and then uh, for, for a couple of weeks and then move to monthly. Becca, would you agree? So a lot of these questions are uh, uh, art more than science, right? Uh, but yeah. <laughs> no, no, I agree. If you're first getting started, it's better to be just babysit the system a little bit more, you know, just in general. And then as things are changing, as the market is changing, um, you know, you can always go in and, and make adjustments as needed. Fair enough, fair enough, fair enough. Um, cool. There are a couple of, e and then the next question you had asked ETA on nudges. Um, it is uh, the, we have uh, three things that happen uh, just so I, uh, I walk you through uh, what we do, right? Number one thing that happens is our data science team puts together the backend for what's going to, uh, when are we going to alert, what are we going to alert, et cetera, et cetera. Then our engineering team puts a little bit of backend about uh, how it would, uh, how they will take it from data science and send it to our front end. And then our front end team, uh, which is why Rishi is here to show you some features, 
they put uh, thought on how are we going to show it to the users, right? So those three parts uh, happen. The nudge idea has started on the data science level, right? Uh, but we are uh, constantly improving them and uh, how we're going to show it. Maybe if time remains, uh, we can also show you that nudge idea of how it would look, but the ETA on that is going to look like uh, January, February, like Q1 of uh, 2023, uh, not this year on the nudges. Um, cool. Rishi, are you still here? Yeah. All righty. Uh, do you want to share your screen and talk about some features? Yep. All righty. Uh, yeah. Um, so uh, the uh, next, I, yeah, yeah. Um, so the next one, we definitely need to want to hear from you and your participation. Rishi has uh, three features that our teams working on, like there are a bunch of features that we're working on, but three that we thought would be helpful to show you the front end designs on so that you could give us some feedback. So uh, uh, for, for the feedback, uh, please type it again in the Q&A or chat. We'd love to hear. Or if you think of feedback later, send it to our support team. Rishi, I'm going to, I'm not sure if you have access to share your screen. Um, can uh, you try sharing your screen? I can't share. Yeah, but uh, uh, yeah, I think you have to stop sharing. Yeah. I did, and yeah. now? Yeah, I, I can, yes. Okay, fantastic, cool. Um, yeah. Fantastic, cool. So, yeah, uh, so can you see my screen, Can you confirm? Yeah. Okay, so, uh, Mainly, we are going to talk about three features uh, that we are in the process of developing and some stuff which is already in development. So uh, I'll take you through one by one. So the first one is basically bulk actions on managed listing space. So the idea behind this feature is basically uh, today, if you want to add tags to properties, you have to go one by one listings and add the tag. So we wanted to bring in bulk actions for sort of adding tags to multiple properties. All like uh, you can add tags to multiple properties in one single go, and same way you can uh, assign groups to properties in one single go, and few other bulk actions, uh, which might be of help uh, than doing it property by property. So uh, I'll show you the designs for it. So. The way it works is basically uh, once you check on the properties that you want to add a tag, then you can select all the, let's say I select all the three listings and I click on add tag. So basically there will be a bulk action tab which appears where you have options which uh, like add tag, you can hide, unhide, assign groups, unmap, delete. So these are some of the bulk actions that you can do on the properties. So if I click on add tag, basically if I enter, let's say one BR and then if it's a Chicago property, I put in Chicago and then if I click on apply tags, those tags get applied to all the properties all at once. You don't have to go property by property anymore. And if I want to hide all of the listings, I can click on hide and it gets hidden. Same way, unhide, like obviously. Uh, and the fourth is assign group. So if I click on assign group, again, uh, a model will appear and you can click on a group. And then if you click on update group, it gets applied to all the properties. And the fourth option is to bulk delete, which already is there, but then we have moved it to this panel so that everything is unified and it's in one single place. So if I click on delete, it gets delete. And also bulk unmapping, where you can select the properties you want to unmap and you can bulk unmap rather than going unmap on the, uh, like, like today how it is, is basically you have to go and unmap on each property, you can uh, bulk unmap. So uh, this is bulk actions on managed listing space. Uh, any questions around this? Uh, yeah, um, mm -hmm. so bulk action, like managed listings page is not something that's used uh, super often, right? But if you, uh, I'm sure like if you have a bunch of properties, if you're changing PMS, if you're um, doing uh, tagging, et cetera, you may end up using managed listings page. Uh, 
if there is any feedback, uh, again, please drop it in that Q&A. We'd love to hear uh, if you have any feedback, whether that's design related or the functionality related, design related. Uh, my question may be like, was that, was that obvious uh, where that black bar was that you, where Rishi was clicking? Was it, was it fairly straightforward? Would you not see it as easily, et cetera, et cetera? Let us know either here in Q and A or in uh, or by emailing support at pricelabs.co. Rishi, do you want to move to the next one? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> sorry. Um, so the next one is uh, listing filters. So today, filters are something which sits at top of the listings on managed listings. Uh, on review pricing page, where it's a single strip with all the filters listed like this. So what this is, uh, so this is there is a limitation to this because if we want to add more criteria with which uh, we want to uh, filter, let's say bedroom size cities, uh, there is an issue with scalability where uh, this design is not helping us doing that. Also, we wanted to add extra features to it uh, where you can save filters and you can come back and use those filters at a later point. So I'll show you how that works. So we move the filter to a single button like this, which is a listing filter. And once you click on it, you have all the criteria with which you can basically filter. So if I click on tax and I can add another criteria, let's say PMS, and then another criteria groups. And then if I click on show listings, this will show me all the listings, which satisfies the criteria that I've selected. And then you can see that there is a icon with the notification of three. If you hover on it, it will show all the criteria which is being applied. And if I click on listing filter again, now there is an ability to save the filter. So if I click on save filter, there is an option where I can click on save current filter, enter the filter name, and I can save it. So you can see that filter is saved. So I can come back anytime later and access this filter and I don't have to do this every time. If there is a filter which you repeatedly use. So if you hover on one of the filter, you can see that there is an option to edit this filter or you can delete this filter. So uh, let's say I select another filter like filter one and I apply, it will show the listings in the saved filter that I selected. And another update uh, that we have given. Uh, so today this uh, search is already there, but we wanted to sort of give an advanced uh, feature where you can select any criteria here and target that if you want to further filter this on the UI. So if I select tax and I can put in tax one and three and uh, easily filter based on that. Also, you can notice that there is the small button here which says any and all. So this is basically the logic of and and or. So what this is doing is, if it is any, the filter is basically looking for listings with any of this uh, tags attached to it. So here you can see that it is tag one and tag three. So the property one has tag one and property two has tag three. So it is looking for any listings that might have any of these tags. So if I click on all, it is looking for listings which has all these tags applied, which there is none. So it will show no listings with criteria. So today uh, we apply only and logic and there is no or logic uh, in the current filter. So we wanted to introduce that. So uh, this is the uh, second feature we wanted to get feedback on. Um, so any questions around this, any feedback, please post it on the Q&A. Um, cool. Um, yeah, it, the, the filter feature is fairly helpful if you're, if you're coming into Price Labs quite often and if you have a lot of properties. Um, let us know in the feedback or again via email if you have any questions uh, that around that. Um, I, I also see some people have raised their hands. I'm just going to allow you to talk if that's, maybe that's easier. Uh, let's try it, we've never done it before. 
Sabrina, I see you raised your hand uh, to speak. Uh, not sure if it was just now or if it was uh, uh, for another thing that we had, we had spoken about. Um, Looks like she unraised I her hand. <laughs> okay. I think James I had his hand raised before when he had a question, but I see Paul just. All right. Um, I allowed Paul to speak. Okay. Hey, Paul. So I'm a newbie. Yeah. I have two properties. Yeah. So could you post a link for the learning video for newbies? Absolutely. Uh, is there other, other, anyone else similar to uh, Paul on the call? Every day, Paul, we run a training 101 webinar, which happens three times a day. Um, oh. Sometimes Becca leads it, sometimes I lead it, sometimes uh, someone else in our team leads it, right? But every day, three times a day. Uh, oh. Becca, can you, can you drop oh. in that link? Yeah, of course. Um, yeah, I'll yeah, be leading cool. it tomorrow on Wednesday if you want to join me. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll show you that link in one second. So you'll be doing it at the same time tomorrow as this one? 2.30 2 p.m. Eastern. It's a little bit later in the day. 2.30 Eastern. Okay. All righty. Um, cool. Thank you. No worries, Paul. Thank you. All righty. Um, Rishi, do you want to show your third thing? Yeah. Um, so the third one uh, is basically improvement to the tooltip that we show when you uh, basically keep your mouse over a price today on the pricing calendar. So today we show the information against uh, currency, but there is no way of understanding how the final price is being calculated based on these uh, numbers that you see. So we wanted to make it obvious on the tooltip as to how this is being calculated and how this affects the pricing and how we arrive at the final price. So this is the new tooltip UI. So uh, Prachi, do you want to help me here? Uh, with? Uh, absolutely, absolutely. So what, uh, like, if you hover on even presently, if you hover on any date, uh, what I mean by that is if you price, can you hop into your price apps account, uh, Rishi? Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, on any any date price, right? If you just keep your mouse, not click. If you keep your mouse, you'll see all of this information. Uh, what this is actually trying to help you is to decode how that two twenty eight was calculated. But unfortunately, it's not as straightforward. We wanted to make it a little bit easier. Uh, we, of course, would love to hear feedback on this. But what Rishi has now done is, can you hop into the design, Rishi? Um, so now, if you uh, put your mouse, what you'd see is, hey, I'm starting from a base price of 4,000. I am adding a certain seasonality, which is 0%. So my price stays 4,000. On top of that, I'm adding a uh, demand factor, which is 7%. So now I've ended up ended up with a uncustomized price. Customized is something that we call in price labs as uh, there is raw price labs recommendation based on market. And then taking into your own operational needs into account is the final price, right? So you, we've ended up with this uncustomized price of 4277. On top of that, we are adding some kind of a portfolio occupancy discount. You've also told us the listing max and min prices are so and so. You've also given us an override on a certain date. And then the final price recommendation is 2200 USD. Of course, the math does not add up in this design, right? But uh, but that, that can help you hopefully uh, understand it a little bit better on how we're uh, coming up with the price recommendation for each day. Uh, again, if you have feedback on this tooltip or uh, uh, of, on this design, what you also see on this tooltip is it's a high demand day. 23% uh, of the neighborhood is occupied on this day. You also see uh, in the right top corner, this is a multi-unit, so more like a hotel style property uh, with uh, five units under it uh, or five rooms under it. So it's 20% occupied. And then at the bottom, you can also see some restrictions that are applied, right? Which is minimum stay, which is uh, 15 days of minimum stay restriction. There's a check-in checkout restriction. And then at the very bottom, you see last seen price, and then um, 
the price with default customizations. This is if uh, you're not changed anything in how Price Labs does things on the left-hand panel in customizations, then the price would have been that number. But currently, the price based on your customizations and edits would turn out to be 2200 Any feedback, again, on this topic would also be super useful. Um, and also, like if you think that this is an uh, important enough update, that would also be lovely to know. Cool. I see two things popped up, uh, maybe related to Chad's feedback is awesome. OK, lovely. Chad, thank you so much. Um, Love it. And then um, can one comp set be built across two different separate markets that are, that are can a comp set be built across two different separate areas that are similar markets? Um, so he had asked, a, sorry, he had asked a question before. Okay. Um, it was- Do you want to just take it? Yeah. Can you compare with more than one geographical area or one more than one neighborhood? Um, and then the follow-up question um, was what you had just said. So when you're creating your market dashboards, you can pull in up to either 1,000 listings or 5,000 listings. It is somewhat geographically tethered. Um, so like if you're in a market like say, say Orlando, Florida, very high density rental market, you're going to get 5,000 listings within a very small, relatively small geographical area. If you're in a market that's maybe like out west where things are a little bit more um, spread apart, you can have a pretty large market dashboard that is going to cover potentially multiple markets. So it kind of depends on the listing density, I would say. Um, but then within those, within that market dashboard, you can sort of say, hey, let's add both this subsection and this subsection and have both of those areas within a particular comp set. Hopefully that makes sense. Yeah. Um, very cool. Very cool. Okay. I have I have a question from Sam that I see. Is there a way to set discounts similar to one built-in Airbnb? Uh, book four nights, do 25%, three nights, 20% discount. Uh, um, not directly on Airbnb. This is something that we call as length of stay discount, right? Um, today for Airbnb, I want to say we support weekly and monthly discounts. So week long, if it's a week long booking or more, there's a certain discount and month long booking and more, there's a certain discount. We are revamping how length of stay works fundamentally in Price Labs, right? Um, that's a that's a big backend change for us. And after that, we'd be launching it for several partners. And if you're directly doing it for Airbnb, uh, we potentially may be able to build it directly for Airbnb. Uh, if you're doing it with your with a PMS, if you're connecting price apps with a PMS, if your PMS allows it over the course of next uh, couple of months, we'd be launching it PMS by PMS on how length of stay discounts work by PMS. Um, we do like if midweek is empty, we do, yeah, makes sense, makes sense. Uh, what you're saying uh, makes sense. The other way to, to do this midweek stuff is also to, Think about: uh, Do you want to add? Uh, if you, if you're frequently seeing that your midweek is empty, you may want to consider uh, the uh, day of week uh, customization. So, for example, if I am uh, in the account, so say I have my account here, and if I am frequently seeing, if I'm frequently seeing maybe my weekdays are not booked. Maybe uh, price lapse is not dipping the prices as low as you would want it to be to stay booked. And you can always see that in the neighborhood data of how, um, for example, uh, and let this load, but you would see how price lapse is dipping these prices. I completely have a random comp set as part of this call, um, but how price lapse would have uh, priced this versus how the market is behaving, right? As you can see, this is also a very weekend versus weekday market, right? Uh, Monday, Tuesdays, Wednesdays, very low bookings. And then on Friday, Saturdays, there are bookings. And you'd see price lapse is dipping prices. But maybe you feel like, hey, you're not dipping far enough. You may you can go in here, uh, do day of week pricing adjustment and say, hey, dip more uh, on Mondays and Tuesdays because I never get bookings on, on Mondays and Tuesdays. And if you do that, price lapse will uh, further decrease those prices. So that's, that's one way to consider. Um, but length of stay is another way, uh, Sam, and uh, that's that's something that's upcoming in the coming months. 
All righty. Um, cool. I would say, uh, I'm not sure if this is a good webinar or not so good webinar because we have, for the first time, I want to say we have finished five minutes before. So okay. <laughs> thank you so much for everyone who joined in. Uh, we still have five minutes saved. So if you have any questions, let us know. Uh, Becca and I can answer. Uh, happy to answer anything that you have not even related to this webinar if we have five minutes. Uh, and otherwise, uh, we'll let all of you guys go. Uh, Thanks so much for joining y'all. Um, one thing I think is cool is I think all of what you covered today, Richie, were suggestions from our users. So oh, yeah. keep, keep them coming. You know, you're making us better. Uh, the product is, you know, we're kind of all in this together. So if you have anything that you would like to see change, do let us know because uh, we are always listening to it. That's what these sort of product update webinars are about. It's sort of your ideas coming to fruition. So. 100%. Yeah. Um, our product, our product roadmap is full, but it is 90% of the time driven by, uh, customers. And then 10% of it is driven by our data science team trying to figure out what's happening in the market. Right. So if you have any feedback, uh, always, whether on these webinars, again, we do these monthly and we send out emails for this and, uh, in product, you get a notification, um, whether through that or via emailing us at support at pricelabs.co, send us anything. We are always listening. We are always trying to improve uh, to make your lives easier. All right. Again, uh, two more minutes. If you have any questions, feel free to type them in here. If not, uh, we will uh, we will see you again next month around the same time. Cool. I don't think so. We're getting any questions. So we can just end this webinar. Thank you so much, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye all.